All right, then. We come to the end of the Peeper book. And a uh, significant culmination, I think, um, and a really encouraging one. So let's just walk through this again. I have uh, several points that I want to make. Um, I want to start off with this theme that was sounded by Pieper on page 34 when he talked about Averroism and the separation of faith and reason. We've been talking about that uh, in, a, in a few different ways, uh, mostly using Pieper, but using a little bit of Dupre on, on this idea as well. And um, uh, it's uh, really important uh, in the culminating remarks that Pieper makes in his book. Again, I think you want to understand faith in a, in a very broad and general sense uh, that has to do with what Pieper is going to call the structure of philosophy uh, in general. And so we, this is what he means uh, when he says on page 100 that there is no such thing as a pure philosophy. Um, and Pieper sees, uh, sees the idea of a pure philosophy as a modern construct, one that is rejected by Sartre and existentialist philosophers uh, he's going. He's he's about to mention a few others as well: Kierkegaard, Heidegger, Marcel. Um, re rejected by, for him, contemporary philosophers, 20th century philosophers, and also rejected, anticipated, if you like, uh, by by Thomas and indeed by Augustine as well. Um, this is very similar to what uh, Dupre was saying about ideology. And uh, so there's a, we're just really um, consolidating this point at, uh, at, at this point at this time. Um, but it's, it's also, you know, um, a restatement of the idea that there is, uh, there is no um, disembodied philosophy. There is no realm of you know, pure thought, of thought alone, that um, thought happens in certain contexts. Properly understood, philosophy is not just a rationalistic kind of number crunching or system crunching kind of exercise. Philosophy is interested in mystery. Uh, philosophy, the philosophical question aims at the mystery of the world on page uh, 100. It is concerned with what things fundamentally are. I, I thought it was such a beautiful example from the last reading of when I ask myself, what is this pen? What is this object? Uh, to ask that question is to ask a question that gets at the very being of things. It's a very old idea, Socratic idea, that philosophy begins in wonder. Um, and um, uh, Pieper is in his own way reminding his uh, reader of that. So so that's the first thing this um, has emerged uh, over the last few mini lectures as a, a kind of running theme. Um, I think it's it goes all the way back to uh, books eight and nine of On the Trinity, Let Us So Seek As If We Were About to Find and So Find As If We Were About to Seek. Um, and it has slowly emerged as a theme in Dupre and, and here in, in Pieper as well. So that's the, that, that's the first thing to sort of take away with us in, a, uh, in, in this closing um, mini lecture on Pieper. Another thing is, is returning to the idea of the Logos. 
just how important that is. And again, the, the context of thinking about the relationship between faith and reason is, is relevant here. Uh, but the notion that the Logos is part and parcel of the way that Thomas thinks. And of course, in referring to the Logos, Augustine is never far away. And indeed, Augustine's name appears at the very top of page 101. Just one little detail on, on here. Um, what things fundamentally are means they are in the Logos. So this divine speaking, the ongoing creativity, uh, the divine sustaining the world, the world in which the world which participates and finds its being in that Logos, in that divine word. Um, but I'll, I'll just say, say this, that when he says, in their respective interpretations of the world, the same place that is occupied in Platonism by the doctrine of the archetypes of all things and the, and the soul is taken in Western Christian ontology by the doctrine of the Logos, by the doctrine of the creative art of God. That phrase, the same place that is occupied, um, it, it's not simply uh, plug and play. It's not, Pieper is not saying that Platonism and Augustinian Thomistic Christianity are the same thing. They're not saying the same thing. And it, again, I re refer you back to Gadamer and how um, Plato uh, asks a question to which he cannot find the answer and proffers an answer, a realm of pure thought that uh, differs from the answer that is advanced, proposed by uh, Augustine and by, and by Thomas. My third point is that, and this in a way returns to the first point uh, about a there being no such thing as a pure philosophy. The, the third point is, is, is for Pieper here, perhaps his, his clearest statement that what Sartre is doing is welcome and that it is founded on what he calls, quote, an article of belief. And the quotation marks are, are his own. Nevertheless, when Sartre, for example, maintains that there are no essences of natural things and above all, no essence of man, because there exists no creative God who could have designed them, it is evident that he is establishing this fundamental thesis of his philosophy on an article of belief. And it's in this context too, uh, this is where Pieper refers to Kierkegaard, Heidegger, Marcel uh, as well. And he's, essentially gesturing to a tradition, to a way of doing philosophy that can be distinguished from the bulk of modern philosophy, especially what is called modern analytic philosophy, uh, where the very word analytic appeals to a mathematical understanding of things and seeks clarity, um, systematization and the the notion that philosophy really does amount to a system and, and does try to close off uh, or make a wrap a circle around what it does um, there is clearly a place for that kind of philosophy that kind of philosophy analytic philosophy approaches science in the sense that um, we have seen that uh, Pieper affirms when, when, when science restricts itself to a certain kind of inquiry. Analytical philosophy, when it restricts itself appropriately, can bring out uh, lots of good things. But in its deepest sense, what he is suggesting here is a structure to thought and a structure to philosophy um, that is truly open-ended. So he says, uh, 
uh, and he, he appeals to, to Plato, to Aristotle, and to Augustine, for whom, right at the very bottom, page 101, the true philosophical act begins with an act of faith. When we consider these seminal forms, the Western quest for knowledge, these seminal forms of the Western quest for knowledge, we realize that they might achieve a timeliness at once affirmative and corrective in the doctrine of Thomas Aquinas. So that there's, he's, he's trying to say that the contemporary questions that are being asked are, are, are answerable with reference to this other tradition that includes um, <clears throat> a certain kind of philosophical thinking, what is sometimes called continental philosophizing, because a lot of people who think this way are from continental Europe, as opposed to the analytic tradition, which is dominated by people in Anglo-American philosophy in England and in the and then in later in the United States. Um, and he's trying to fold, well, well, not fold Thomas into that tradition, but suggest that there's a conversation there. Uh, that there are resources in Augustine and Thomas uh, that can make uh, that 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 are that are relevant for the contemporary conversation. This the the final um, sort of point uh, that I want to take from this reading. Uh, the final point that I think that uh, Pieper wants to integrate into the things that he's saying here in these last pages is gestured to on page 102 when he says in considering the teaching of St. Thomas we should not understand it merely as the material substance of an explicitly formulated set of doctrines. Um, some readers might not you know cotton on to what he's talking about there but he really is expressing uh, impatience and uh, with the with the notion of Thomas as an authoritative source for a set of doctrines. He doesn't want, um, he, he doesn't like the idea of appealing to Thomas as the basis for an, an unfolding rationalistic program. And we, we've talked about this before, it's come up before in, in Peeper. Um, and and he's, he's coming back to that, coming back to that now as if you know, Peeper gives you your revelation and then all you have to do is unfold the implications of it. He really sees Thomas as doing something more truly philosophical um, and, and, and truly open-ended. Yes, it is enabled by the, uh, by the beliefs uh, that he affirms, but he's really interested in this fearless pursuit of truth and in engaging other thinkers. And this is where Pieper uses the terms like recognition or reintegration. Um, seeing that other people from Aristotle onward uh, are engaged in uh, a genuine seeking, uh, a genuine asking after the truth of things that he can learn from and that he can engage with and that he can then take his understanding and reformulate the input of others in a way that coheres within uh, the framework uh, that, that he receives uh, as, a, as a Christian thinker. But there's a profound openness to this and, and it's, it's not meant to be, it's meant to be more of a, a listening posture rather than a, a rationalistic unfolding uh, posture. 
it's a proposing a um, revisioning for, that is an invitation for any uh, reader or thinker to inhabit and to find there, and this is a very Aristotelian notion, to find there a source of flourishing or a, a place of flourishing. Um, we see here on page 103 the, the acceptance of the whole of the realm of, uh, the whole of the realm of, of, of reality. And, and this, is, this is what rhetoric can be as well. This is, rhetoric can be this sort of participation in a wholeness and the making available of a wholeness for inhabitation. And this I would argue and, and, and was su suggesting trying to be as understated as possible, was suggesting was how to read Augustine, trying not to prove his points, not to see whether he proves his points, not to engage him in that rationalistic kind of way, but to engage him rhetorically as proposing something for inhabitation and seeing whether one can flourish uh, in that uh, in that understanding. Um, so that brings us on page 105 to the idea that, you know, we're never just supposed to, and Pete was talking here specifically about Thomas and still with that, that idea of Thomas as being invoked as a rationalistic thinker and is giving us sort of the way to settle all, all debates. He, he's saying, look, you, you have to interpret it goes back to the idea that appropriation is interpretation. And here he, he uses the phrase, uh, the dangers of sterile imitation. You're never just rote learning. You're never just, you know, oh, deciding that you accept a set of propositions and then just trying to imitate it or follow it slavishly. And again, this is another aspect of what rhetoric is. Genuine rhetoric is active. Uh, genuine dialogue is active. There is always a necessary place for creativity and and involvement, and this involvement um, has to be in one's own time. And that this brings us—I think it's still this is so such a profound um, closing statement that I think that it works really well for closing off the time that we spend. Uh, with Augustine and with Thomas, uh, and in, in seeking the, the how to answer the problems of modernity, as we approach modernity in, in one sense, and and as we are looking at modernity from the other side, uh, from our from our own time, I think this is still a, a very relevant uh, kind of kind of statement. So. And it takes us back to that idea of history, uh, the relationship, you know, how history is given as a whole, uh, as there's an inventedness to it, and yet it has to be unpacked over time, this Gadamerian idea that he's taking from Augustine. And um, so that, that theme, or the theme of the, the unity uh, within the multiplicity, the vision of a whole, uh, within a, a givenness of time, within finitude, that is given real, real profound um, affirmation here, uh, real profound support in this paradoxical formulation on page 106, that the fullness of truth can never be grasped by a neutral and indifferent mind, but only by a mind seeking the answer to a serious and urgent existential problem. In other words, the goal of the thinker or the person who is actively engaged in their time is not to bring together all ideas and theories into one you know, massive whole. It is to seek the answer to the problem that is most pertinent to one in one's own time. And that in seeking the answer to that question, that one might catch a glimpse 
or a, get a sense of the wholeness of truth. And that's the, that's the paradox that Augustine and Thomas are, are, are working with, that we sense the wholeness of truth in the particular, not only the, the pen or the cup or the object of contemplation, but in the time, in the moment, in the problem that we are trying to address, that we are trying to solve. And it, it relates too to the notion of, you know, are things knowable? In, in another dimension, are things solvable? Uh, are problems, you know, can, can they be dealt with? Or do we just spin our wheels? Do we just existentially get through our own time and really don't do anything, don't accomplish anything? And, 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 and Thomas would say, no, 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 no. The problems of a specific time are solvable and they're solvable precisely because one has a vision of the whole, but in a way that is applicable in one's own time. And it doesn't solve all problems for all times, but it's it, it one can solve one's problems for one's own time. And again, um, dialogue and rhetoric are crucial to that. They're not just value added or tag alongs or frills or extra dimensions. They're integral to that because design and essence go together. Okay, I, I think that that's, um, I think that's all I wanna say. I guess I have one other note here that I think comes from the last page that you want to experience your own time, that you want to, you want to be aware of your own time. And so I, I think that material like this can, encourage us to do that, can be an incitement to do that, knowing that there is something to be gained from experiencing your own time, not just getting through it, but actually contributing to the, uh, the solutions of the problems that, that are in your time, that are in my time. All right, I think that that's all I wanna say about these, uh, this last reading from Peepers. So I'm gonna leave it there. Bye for now. <laughs>